Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah, happy Mother's Day. Man, I'm so glad you guys are here celebrating with us um, this morning. I want to talk to you about solidifying the foundation of the family. I think that's, every mother would like to hear that. Mom is a foundational part of that family. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Um, There's something about Mother's Day, you just, as a pastor, you just announce it and people start crying. They don't do that for Father's Day. I don't know why that's different than that. But Mother's Day is an awesome day to celebrate. I've had godly women in my life since the time I was born and before I was born. So that's a great foundation that is set by them. Um, man, I had, a, I had a good week this week. I got to work out in the yard some too much this week and yesterday I got stung by five wasps have you ever been stung by five wasps not all at the same time they spread it out they didn't do it all at once I I backed up and sat down I was working on a sprinkler thing and I backed up and sat down against a nest that was in a hose that I didn't know and they hit me three times in the back and then when I put my hand back there to figure out what was going on, they stung my hand. And so I was sitting down, so I fell down. So they're flying around me, and I'm knowing, I got to get up, I got to get up. I'm trying to get up and run. And I don't do that very quick at all. <laughs> Finally, I think they just said, oh, he's old, let him go. They let me go. <laughs> I limped out, out of the battle. And then later on, a red wasp got me right here, you know. <clears throat> they're mad. They're mad. I didn't know they knew anything about politics. <laughs> you know? Or the price of oil. Or China. Or Putin. They do. They know. They're mad. And so they stung me. Anyway, isn't that fun? Yeah, I love life. It's good. Uh, <clears throat> scripture says in Malachi talking about the relationship of man and woman 215 says this it says did he not make them one with a portion of the spirit in their union and what was the one God seeking godly offspring so guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. Isn't that a good verse? What did God put man and woman together for? To raise up godly offspring. I like that. It's awesome. That's a great, great verse. It's God's intention that man and woman become one flesh so we can build a spiritual foundation for a healthy family. That's good stuff. So, what are the steps? To building a healthy foundation. We have to have a good foundation. If we're going to build anything of significance. That may last for a certain amount of time. Or a certain period of time. And so we have to build with a solid foundation. Especially when it comes to the family. And so we're talking about family fixer upper. So if we're going to fix up this family. Then uh, we're going to have to talk about the foundation. What are the foundational issues to create the spiritual family that God wants us to have? What's the stuff that we're really going to build on? So I'm going to share you a few of those, share with you a few of those today. Are you good with that? You okay? For Mother's Day, I think mothers will be totally in support of this. I texted my mom this morning and said, Mom, happy Mother's Day. Good morning. I'll talk to you later, right? So I'll talk to her again. I asked mom one time, I said, Mom, what is it? I'm, I'm about to speak to some mothers and their families. What do you think I should say? One Sunday I called her and asked her that. And she said, well, <clears throat> tell them that they're really going to have to depend on the Lord. And she said, and by the way, be sure you tell them it's going to take a whole lot of patience. So I think that was me that created that and her. But she, uh, So it'll take a lot of patience. So it's going to take some work. It takes some foundational work. 
to build a family the way that God wants us to build a family. Now, how do we begin to do that? Well, let me share some things from the Bible, maybe from a direction that you've, you know, different than you've ever thought of before. Okay, here's number one. Number one, when it comes to building godly foundational activity into the family, never miss the opportunity for a good God conversation. Did you hear that? Never pass it up. Never miss it. Every moment could be a moment for a God conversation. And you don't want to miss it with your children. Every time you have the opportunity, talk about it. Deuteronomy eleven nineteen says it this way. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and whenever you get up. It's talking about the commandments and the things of God. Teach them to your children as you walk along the roads, when you're lying down, when you're getting up. What's he telling us? Never miss an opportunity for a good God conversation with your children. Just commit to having the conversation. Okay, <clears throat> now I promise you this, one thing is sh- assured, they will always be awkward at first. God conversations just tend to be awkward, I don't know why. <clears throat> it's just one of those things, <clears throat> spiritually, when we begin to speak and we begin to talk about this, sometimes they're just a little bit uncomfortable, but your family needs to hear them. Your family needs to experience the God conversation. Okay. Now here's the thing about God conversations. They don't have to be earth shattering or heaven shattering. They just have to be conversations. They just need to be natural. You just need to talk about the stuff of God with your family. Don't be afraid. You're not doing anyone a favor by allowing them to grow up in a spiritual vacuum. Don't do that. Oh, they'll figure it out on their own. Yeah, they will. And you're not going to like what they figure out. I promise you. Okay. No, no, no. You, the Bible says you lay some foundation. You help them along the road. Talking to Jesus, as we sing about, just doesn't come natural all the time. You're going to have to help them. But you want to be natural as you can in your conversations with them. Now, how do we make our God conversations natural? How do we make them flow? Okay, let me help you with that. Number one, let your heart be filled with God's word. One of the ways that you make this natural is you just let God fill your heart up with his word. Okay? The Bible says it this way. It says, hide my word where? Hide my word in your heart. In your heart, hide my word. So, You're going to have to read some of it because it doesn't get in your heart unless you read it, unless you put it in your brain and then it goes to your heart, okay? So the more you can know about God's word and the more you let your heart be filled with God's word, the better you're going to be at the God conversations that you're going to have to have. So that means that you've got to be committed to God in your own heart and your own life if you're going to hand it out, okay? So let your heart be filled with God's word. Secondly, let your eyes be fixed on God's word, okay? Your eyes have to be fixed on God's word. Keep your eyes on the object ahead of you. My dad taught me when you're driving the car and if you want to go straight, you fix your eyes on the object in front of you and drive towards that object. When you drive towards that object, you'll drive straight. You have to fix your eyes on that. Some of you guys were watching NASCAR yesterday. They teach a NASCAR driver when you're driving a car fast speeds around the circle. They say don't ever focus on the outside of the circle. You focus where? On the inside. You focus where you're going, not where you're afraid of going. And when you focus on the inside, you'll stay the track. If you start focusing on the outside and have fear of running into the outside wall, you're going to crash into the wall. you got to have your eyes fixed. I can remember one day when I went to, back to my home church and I looked up and there was a young lady by the name of Tisa that was there. And I remember when she walked by in a corner of my eye, I noticed her and I thought, oh, that's a pretty girl. And my eyes fixed on her. And it was just kind of, you know, as she walked around, I, it, was, it was, I couldn't help it. 
Okay, I got fixed on her. I've been fixed on her ever since then. I haven't taken my eyes off of her since that time, right? I don't know if she's wearing a blue jumpsuit, but uh, <laughs> today she was. But I was fixed on her. And Jesus says that we need to be fixed on his word. If, I'm, if I got his word, if I have his word in my heart and I'm fixed on his word, then conversations about God are going to be really natural for me. I'm going to talk about it. Hey, let's talk about God today. And every time your children get in the car with you, you've got five or ten minutes to talk about God. You may have to unplug something out of their ears, but that's okay. They know how to work that. And then you want to have those God conversations. The scripture tells us, let your heart be filled with God's word. Let your eyes be fixed on God's word. And then it says this, let your conversation be from God's word. You need to speak God's word to them. Okay? Um, some uh, commentators, when they are theologians, when they would talk about Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, they would talk about that God's word. You need to speak it in such a way that it's as if you were employed by it. I'm employed by it. You know, um, as men, we we our conversation is always, well, what do you do? Hey, what do you do? Oh, well, I'm an engineer. I'm a chemist. I'm a preacher. I don't know. Whatever you are, you know. What do you do? And then sometimes someone will say, well, I'm retired. You know what I say? Well, then what do you do while you're retired, right? That's where the conversation goes next. Oh, I play golf. Oh, I fish, you know. You know, what do you do? We, we're always wondering about that. And the scripture tells us that if we're going to have the natural conversations that the Lord wants us to have, it says that you need to be employed by the word of God. I'm hired by it. It's what I do. I speak it. I talk it. It's my every day. It's a natural part. It just comes out of my mouth sometimes. And so my heart is filled with God's word. My eyes are fixed on God's word. And my conversation is coming, employed by God's word. Now all of a sudden, I'm having the conversations that are the conversations that my children and my family, they need to hear. And so you never miss that chance. You want to grab hold of that opportunity for a God conversation in your life. And don't shy away from it. Just do it. It might be uncomfortable. It might be awkward. You might not feel like the expert. It's okay. Nobody is. Nobody's an expert here. Just do it. Just make it a part of who you are. So building a foundation, number one, I'm never going to miss an opportunity for a God conversation. I'm going to look for them. I'm going to search for them. I'm going to find them. And I'm going to take advantage of those. Okay, number two. This is important. Remind your family that they are a personal part of the plan of God. You're a part of God's plan. He's a personal God. You're a personal part of his plan. And don't forget it. God's plan is for you. It's for you. It's for you. You're a part of it. God loves you. And he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross so you could be right in the middle of God's plan for your life in the forgiveness of your sin. He loves you. And he wants you to be a part. I love the scripture in Isaiah 43, 1. It says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Good verse. Reminds us of who we are in Christ. I've, I've redeemed you, called you. You're mine. Your kids, your wife, your family, they need to hear this. Hey, man, you're God's. You belong to him. God's a personal God. So he always deals with his children in a personal way. And you just remind your children, hey, God's doing something personal in you. He's working in you. You might have to remind them, I remember when you were... 11, 12 years old and you committed your life to Christ. And, and I remember that you were baptized. And boy, what a great time. Boy, that was great. I could just tell God was working in you. My, my father led me to Christ when I was eight years old. Pretty young. But he led me to make a decision. I sat on his knee there and made a commitment. He explained how you start down the wrong road in life. And then 
Jesus is a way that you can move back over and get on the road that God intended. And he talked about how we sin and that puts us down that road, but we could recover just by receiving Christ. My dad, he, he, a layman in an oil field, explained that to me. And so as, as a little kid, I placed my faith into Jesus. He has a special plan that's just for you. God always has a plan and a future for his people, the scripture tells us. He always has a special plan. I love Isaiah because in Isaiah 43, and the, the book is just changing right there at, at, at Isaiah 43. God is in the middle of chastising his people for the first part of Isaiah. God is correcting them and he's correcting his people aggressively. Okay, his, his people, <clears throat> they didn't just like make a little mistake. They totally wiped God out of their life. God didn't even exist in their life no more. And God is punishing his people severely. Okay? They're going into a really tough time. And then now he's changing. Now the correction is over and now the healing begins in 43 verse 1. And he says, fear not for I have redeemed you. I've saved you. I've called you. You're mine. See, the healing's beginning now. He's reminding them uh, of the healing that's beginning. And now the healing begins and God's tone totally changes. Now, my parents used to tell me, this hurts me far more than it hurts you. Okay? I never bought that. I still don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. I'll guarantee you it didn't hurt them as much as it hurt me. But I know one thing for sure. They just did it because they love me. They corrected me. They, they you know, levied a punishment based on the sin and I deserved it. And they did it because they didn't want me to live in that life. They loved me. They wanted to see a better future that they could see for me that I maybe didn't see for myself. They loved me. My dad, when he was... 40 years old, was running up some stairs on an offshore rig. He said, we turned, he was, he was selling them some equipment, and he was there on the rig, and he turned around and started running up the stairs of the rig, and he said, it felt like somebody hit me in the chest with a sledgehammer. He had a heart attack on the rig. Um, I'll never forget that. And he said, it just, he goes, I've never been hit like that before. Okay. And he said, just knock me down. Uh, it hit him that hard. Have you ever been smote by God? That's what the Bible says. God will smote you if you monkey around with him as his people. You've been smote before? I've been smote before. I've been hit by the Lord. And I thought, I think I might need to change something in my life. You ever been corrected severely by God? Well, that's what's happening in this verse. They've been smoked. They've been hit. God, why is this happening to me? And they're hurt. And then he begins the process of personal healing. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I've purchased you with a price. I've redeemed you, and I call you, and you're mine. And because you're mine, I will do what? I will protect you And I will deliver you. You can trust me all the time. I'll be there for you. Great verse. Great verse. It's like God's pulling out the insurance deck sheet and saying, let's talk about your benefits just a little bit here. What do you got here? What's in it for you? Okay. Hey, guess what you have? My personal protection is always there. Yeah, I I chastised you. I smote you a little bit. But don't worry, I'll be here to protect you. I'll deliver you from the current situation, any other situation that you might face. I will be here to deliver you. You are mine. I have a plan and I have a purpose. I just want you to follow it. We got to remind our children something. Hey, God has a plan for you. It's a personal plan. It's his will that will make the impact in your life. It's his will that will change everything. You just have to begin to follow that. And our family need to be, need to be reminded, hey, God's a personal God. He loves you. He cares for you. He will direct you. He will correct you. He will heal you. He'll come beside you. He'll protect you at all times. He's there for you.
So the end of that verse is, I'll, I'll protect you and I'll deliver you every time. So our family, we need some natural conversations. They need to be reminded they're a part of God's plan. Here's the third thing that's foundational when I'm building the foundation and fixing up my family the way God would want it to be. Number three is this. You need to put some time into cultivating each family member's giftedness. Every child, your spouse, they're specially gifted by God in their own unique way. And they need you to build on that in their lives. They need to be encouraged. There's something they have that nobody else has. I love this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. Fan the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. I laid my hands on you. I prayed for you. Paul says to Timothy, you're specially gifted. I'm praying that God is going to use that gift in a powerful way. And I'm lifting you up that you may find the fullness of your giftedness. The same thing we should do for our children. Every time. How do you get, you're gifted in some way and I want you to get the best out of it because God wants to use you. This is so important in the life of your family members that it needs your attention. It needs your intention also. It needs your attention, but it needs your intention. Intentionally do this. Work on it. Find out what they're good at. Help them get better. Okay? Um, when I feel the need to pray for someone, you know what I do? I pray for them. Right? Hey, I, you know, I feel the need to pray for you. You mind if I pray for you? Okay, I pray. Not everybody will let me do that, but most people will that I know, okay? Most people I know are in church, you know what I mean? So, so they would let me do that, okay? And so if, if, I, if I feel the need to pray for someone, I pray for them. Now, when I feel the need to pray fervently, that's a Bible word, fervently for them, aggressively, super more for them, I'll place my hand on their back or their shoulder and I'll pray for them. I saw a friend yesterday and who's in a heated fight with cancer and I couldn't help but put the hand on them to say, I'm, I'm, I'm comforting you, I'm with you, behind you, praying for you. It's a special touch. Some situations just call for a personal touch and your family members need a personal touch. They need you sometimes just to put your hand on them and say, you know, you're so gifted. I just pray that God's going to use that gift of fullness in your life. They just need to be encouraged and lifted up. And man, if you start doing this, you're really putting people on the right track. You know, that's that special touch. I was ordained to the ministry back in the early 1800s. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It wasn't that long ago. It seemed like it. But uh, not too long ago, at Alamo Heights Baptist Church in San Antonio, Texas. And um, they put a hand on me, prayed for me, for my giftedness. And I invited my philosophy professor to come and to, <laughs> to officiate the ceremony. And so he came and he asked me hard questions. He said, Les, I'm going to ask you some really tough questions, but... Don't be afraid. It's just so you can show what you know. It's, it's your opportunity. That scared me. And so he asked me a question about the inerrancy of Scripture, which was a hot topic at that time. And so I muddled through a answer to the best that I could, I could through my theological knowledge and Bible knowledge. And I couldn't tell if I answered it well or not so I'm thinking about how I just answered it and he asked me another question but I didn't catch the question because I was thinking about what he had just asked me and I said oh I'm sorry I missed that last question I was thinking about how well I answered the one before that I didn't mean to say it that way but that's the way I said it. I was thinking about how well I answered that he said well the next question had something to do with humility and I was like, 
I didn't mean to say it like that. That's not what I was trying to say, okay? I was in a weird place all of a sudden, you know, trying to get, and, they, and so the congregation laughed and had a good time at my expense, just like the wasps that I ran into the other day. And they put their hands on me and they prayed, prayed my giftedness. You see, we, we need to put that intention to our family sometime. We need to pray for them. I want God to use you. I want you to be a part I want you to feel God's movement in your life. God's given you something special. I want you to use that in your life. Whether you use it on the job or at the church or in the community or wherever you might use that. Each family member is personally gifted by God. And we have to understand that. And it's your job to fan the flame of giftedness till it begins to shine and burn in their life, you need to encourage their giftedness to flourish in their lives. A few months ago, while we were in the vacation in Colorado, the vacation from hell, um, as turned out to be great, of course, like all vacations, just some rough spots in there. I didn't know I was going to have to snowmobile to my cabin. I thought I was going to drive there in my truck. And so uh, we would go out and spend the day doing some activities together on a snowmobile. And then um, at the end of the day, we would come in. In the evening, we would come in, and you're tired and you're cold. And I always felt when I came in, my family needs a fire, so I would build a fire. I would just start to I would walk in, you know, get the clothes off and... This is why I live in South Texas, so we don't have to take all those clothes off. And so and then I would build the fire because my family just needed the fire. And as a family leader, we're supposed to be building some healthy fires in our family. We're supposed to be fanning some of the godly flames that exist. We're supposed to be aiding them in finding the fullness of what God has created them to be. And challenging them. Be all that God created you to be. Keep the flame stirred up. Why? Why why are we committed to that in our kids? Because the reality is we have to hand the flame off to the next generation and they have to carry the flame after that. It's like the Olympics. You know when they run in through the Olympics? Back when I used to watch it and they would come running in a gate with the with the big flame and then they would hand the flame off and then someone would carry the flame and then they would hand the flame off and then someone else would carry the flame till they came into the stadium to the, the big, you know, final lighting, the big giant flame that would burn throughout the event, right? The Olympics. Well, that's what we're doing spiritually. We got to hand this flame off. We're not going to carry it to the end. We're probably not going to see the end. Oh, we might, but probably not. So the flame is going to have to be handed off somehow to the next generation. We have to back off and say, you're going to have to carry the flame. And we don't want to hand them a flame that's about to burn out. We want them to get it while it's burning hot. So we have to give it over. We have to pray and fan that flame and keep that flame going in their lives. And so the scripture says, fan the flames of the gift of God inside others. Do it for your children. So we've got to put some time into that. Is, that, is this helping you at all? Am I giving you some foundations, some God conversations that we're going to have to have? Reminding them that they're a personal part of God's plan and putting time into cultivating their giftedness you know we're just investing in the family some of you got some beautiful children awesome and you teach them a lot of stuff we teach them how to brush their teeth and go to bed on time and get up in the morning and be polite be responsible but do you teach them what matters the most the things of jesus you talk to them about eternity, about spiritual things. Are you having good conversations with them? Well, put the time into cultivating their giftedness from God. Here's number four. This is the last one. I have to close because Trent is here. Um, he's going to give me a hard time for that. 
make yourself the family's biggest public and private cheerleader. This is a solid foundation. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Yours may say John in your outline. That's because I messed up. First John. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You will overcome. It's foundational that your family knows that you're in their corner. That you're supporting them, you're loving them. And if they will continue in the true things of God, then God also will be in their corner at all times behind them. Here's a catch. They can't continue in the true things of God if they've never been taught about them. They can't embrace the things of God if they've never heard about them. And so it comes your responsibility to talk to them. Teach the family about living a faith in Christ. And then cheer them on to live that faith in Christ. Be their public cheerleader. Be their private cheerleader no matter what they do. Now, if you fail to teach them to live for Christ, you're giving them an uneven playing field. Because Satan will be far ahead in the game. You want to be ahead. They they can't rally to beat their opponent. Okay? And I didn't say that right. They can rally to beat the opponent. But they can do it best if they have the home crowd behind them. I've seen a couple of exciting football games in my days. Uh... One time I went to the Blue Bonnet Bowl in Houston and the University of Texas was playing Colorado and Colorado was spanking them through the first half, 33 to zip. They were just beating the snot out of them. And the most obnoxious man in Colorado was sitting right in front of me, (laughs) yelling, cheering. I was thinking things that pastors shouldn't think about him and... And they came out the second half, and Texas comes from behind and beats them, 36 to 33. I rubbed it in his face so much. (laughs) That was so fun. He just cried. When the game was over, he just sat there and cried. You know, just beat him. Well, that's awesome. Another game a few years ago, Charles drug me up to... uh, San Antonio to the Alamo Dome and we watched TCU play Oregon. TCU was, they lost their quarterback first half. First stringer was gone. They were getting beat at halftime. They were just getting drummed and by Oregon. Oregon was just spanking them. And so we decided let's, you know, we need to kind of, you know, make our way, you know, it, it got towards the end of the game we decided we need to make our way down so that we can go ahead and get out of here when this thing is over. But TCU made a comeback. And we ended up stand, and standing up and watching the final three overtimes that they were in, and they finally won the game. They came back. It was an awesome game. In fact, it's, it's rated as one of the top three most exciting football games in college history. I think Charles told me that. He knows those kind of stats. I would never know that. Uh, God will help you overcome the enemy, but it's probably better if you don't give Satan a 33-point start. Don't start there. Start even. Start on top. Get ahead. Put your family out on top. Make the playing field uneven if you can help it. You see, we want them to come through. We want them to shine the way the Lord wants them to shine. So you have to make yourself the family's biggest public and private cheerleader and if you're busy cheering you won't have time to tear them down you'll just have time to cheer them on some solid foundation that we could have as we build this family because we want this family to be God's family and so we're going to be having some God conversations we're going to be talking about their special giftedness we're going to be flaming the fire in their life and we're going to be making ourselves their biggest public and private cheerleader And if you'll do that, 
You'll be shocked at what God can do with the members of your family. You'll be shocked the way the Lord will come through. You'll be shocked about the peace and the grace and the faithfulness and how you'll overcome the challenges in your life. And you'll be shocked at how God will move and will work and will use the members of your family. Isn't that cool? We just need to commit ourselves to building the foundation. Let's bow our heads together for a time of prayer. I don't know where you are in your struggle with your family. But probably there's parts of this foundational activity that you're really not totally right on. There may be some parts that you can improve. Well, guess what? God wants you to do that. First of all, you have to know... You have to know the Lord yourself. His word has to be in your heart. His presence has to be in you. You've got to get it right with God. Not perfect, but right with the Lord. And you've got to trust him and believe in him. And then you begin to pass that torch on to the lives of your children. And let me tell you something. It's never too late. Those were exciting games. They came from behind. It took a lot of cheering to help them get there. And you might think, I'm late on this, Pastor. No, you're not. You just give it to God. The Lord can make up time quick if you trust him and believe him. You just walk in him. Just walk in him. Encourage, love, build, invest. Put the time in your family. You'll be pleased at what will happen when you do. Stay faithful. Trust the Lord. All right? So whatever it would take for you to get that right, why don't you pray and ask God to help you build that foundation, at least start building that today, okay? Make that your prayer. I'll give you just a second to do that. Go ahead and build that. Go ahead and pray that prayer that you're going to begin to build that in your life. I'll just give you a few seconds to do that. Make it your prayer right now. Father, today we thank you for this worship time and this service. We thank you for your message. Help us, God, to fix our families up, to have the families that you want us to have. Help us to do it for your glory. We're going to give you all the credit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, guys. Thank you.